Okay. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Good morning. My name, my name is Morning Basin. My name is Christina Rai. I'm the Chief Operating Officer here at the Asia School of Business. Uh, I come from Bank Nagara itself. I'm here on secondment. So in 2015, Bank Nagara Malaysia um, partnered or collaborated with uh, MIT Sloan uh, to set up the Asia School of Business. Uh, many would ask, why is a central bank uh, in the business of a business school? Well, essentially, we believe education is critical. Um, if you follow Bank Nagara, um, since 2000, we have been coming up with um, our vision for the Malaysian financial sector, um, putting in context where we should go, giving signals and communicating to the financial sector how they need to grow and adapt. Since 2000, our financial sector blueprints and master plans, we just released one last year, have consistently wedged in the topic of talent. Finance is a very talent intensive, knowledge based business. But on top of that, technology has always played a role, but today it's playing a more critical role. For us in the central bank, the financial sector must serve the economy, not the economy serving the financial sector. So why did we partner with MIT Sloan? We liked that both our missions were very aligned. We believe in building transformative individuals, but also those who are very anchored to the right principles. You cannot have, you cannot know uh, what to do without knowing the right thing to do. So in our mission, in our ethos at Asia School of Business, it's all about nurturing principled and transformative leaders. So we started off with the MBA program and we have recently redesigned the two year MBA to a one year, which starts in September without losing any of the central components of what it is to do an MBA. Um, it may be losing its luster today. We hear that, you know, MBAs, people are questioning, why should I do an MBA? You should be asking, why shouldn't I do an MBA at a time when there's so much change and I have to find my place and how I fit in this world that's changing. And an MBA brings together all the important components of not just running a business, but understanding the executive decisions. What keeps the C-suite up at night? We have learned in, in, my, in my career, I've been in Bank Nagara for 30 years, 32 actually now, if you think about it. Um, I always tell my new hires, clever is given. That's why you got through the door. But common sense, that's not given. And sometimes common sense is very uncommon. And that's what we find more and more. The MBA brings together all the features of what you should do to synthesize and not be just concerned about your interest and your area of domain knowledge. You have to understand why the accountant speaks this way, why the finance officer speaks this way, why the new chief sustainability officer is thinking in a way. Risk, people. And as you grow, you become more and more attuned to executive temperament. You have to also have the ability, it's not charisma. You need to kindle confidence in others. You don't need to be an extrovert. You don't need to be a shy introvert. You have to, if you are, well, mask it and project something beyond you because the organization, and in my case, in Bank Nagara, the country must survive, must thrive, must flourish. And your ability to synthesize is what will differentiate you. That is what an MBA does. It differentiates you from a silo, mono, technical, one area. I don't, I don't believe in mono. I think mono is, is necessary, but as you grow up and grow upwards, you have to harness the best of others. And that is what an MBA, administration, how do you administer the best out of everyone's strength, complement each other? So why 
do we do this as a central bank? As I said, we want the financial sector to grow and serve the economy. We have seen time and again how greed, excessive risk, um, and dangers, not just an organization or a firm, but the country. I joined Bank Nagar in 1992, and my onboarding was all about Bank Nagara's foreign exchange losses because the sterling crashed out of the ERM. And we had a taint on us. But those were high level decision making. But in the bank itself, I found incredible individuals, very passionate very much into doing good for the country. And then in 95, Nick Leeson brought Barings Bank down. I went to visit a friend, well, a friend of mine came from Italy and I met him in the lobby of the Regent Hotel. And I sat there waiting for him. And then I realized, hey, a few weeks ago, Nick Leeson stayed at the Regent Hotel fleeing Singapore. Barings Bank was one of the oldest banks, was the bank that served the Queen of England was the bank that funded the Napoleonic Wars. And in an instant, it was gone because of behavior, bad behavior, risky behavior. Clever, but really, did you have the right motive? 2008. Again, you know what you should not do, but you did it because you wanted to pad up the figures. 2009, Bank Nagara redefined our Central Bank Act. We were born in 1959. By 2009, we refreshed our Central Bank Act to give us powers. And we looked around the 1997 crisis, the crisis of um, 2008, and we redesigned uh, our act and came up with the Financial Stability uh, uh, Services Act as well, everything to to put together, but that act is incredibly, incredibly powerful, but we use it with great discretion. We learned that in order to get that autonomy, we have to also exercise responsibility. There are many ministries that do not want us to have that power. So we had to have a compromise. But what it gives us is, if there is a behavior in any sector, if there is a hint of instability, we will come in for the sake of the country and it's defined there in the best interest of the nation and there is no other sector in Malaysia that has that phrase of best interest of the nation so this school is a personification of what we as a central bank believe individuals should aspire and here we have so much interaction with a great personality Joe Cherian I don't think he needs to work he's made it really but this is the other thing, um, coming to ASB and, and interacting with people from MIT and all over the world, we realize that there is one thing that connects us all, the mission of doing good for others. If you've read his profile, you know, you know, um, engineer from MIT, <laughs> finance masters and PhD from Cornell, working in the private sector, you know, handling billions as chief investment officer at Credit Suisse, working in and serving NUS in their, you know, intellectual rigor. But he's back here because he wants to give back to the nation. And I may share he's a Rolodex. Um, in Bank Nagara, I, I, I don't really mix because we are taught to keep an arm's length distance. So coming here, I had to like, reach out to people and he's the first person I go to and it's always like do you know this person yes can you connect me sure and after a while I'm like actually who are you not connected to maybe we start with that rather than <laughs> but here's the thing he wants to give back he's going to teach you about finance and crisis but behind this session you're going to have I'd like you to also understand of the kind of people we draw to ASB and Kolewali do you know what Kolewali means in Nigerian where he's from one who brings wealth. I'm like, and you do finance? I don't know, but your parents got it right. But the principle of it must be anchored. So the executive temperament, this is what an MBA is meant to give you. It's not a mechanical uh, model based. Our program is wonderful. You learn men's manners, the MIT's uh, pedagogy of, of uh, motto, 
which then brings in mind over and then hand, think and then do. Our action learning is a pedagogy we, 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 we um, push through all throughout the, the, the learning experience. But then it's the right thing to do. That one, as I was taught, integrity is what you do when nobody can see you. That was how I was brought up in the bank. And I've seen many people fall by the sword of principles. Also people who stood by their principles and would not shake great principles. So to be touched by greatness is incredible. And when you come here, you have the umbilical cord and the community of people who are touched and will give you that greatness. So when I ask Kole Wale, why? Why come to ASB? It's not just about the business school, the MBA, but the opportunity to come to a pulsating region, to learn something, to marry later on Africa and Asia, to have an impact. And that, again, is what differentiates. To be different is one, but to make a difference is even greater. And I think today, when you listen to Joe and, and Kolewale, I'd like you to understand that at the end of the day, we're here to make a difference. It'll take time, but this journey is impactful. And I like to end on, um, I, I don't know, are you familiar with Simon Sinek? Yeah. The one that I love most about Simon is when he talks about living a fulfilled life. You can achieve. Anyone can accomplish and achieve. Anyone can get their A's. Anyone can be the best. But to be fulfilled and live a life fulfilled, you have to serve others. And that is where the distinction is, to make an impact, to serve others, to come back, to act for the greater good, to give back to Asia and Malaysia beyond what you can already get and, and live in Florida and smoke cigars. <laughs> he doesn't smoke. He doesn't drink. So anyway, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. And... Um, Introducing you to Joe and Kolewale. Thank you very much, Christina. Uh, let me tell you what a privilege it is to have Christina open for us. I personally asked her to uh, do it. Uh, she's one of our leading women in Malaysia, in Asia, in fact, and, um, and uh, proud that ASB promotes a lot of women at leadership positions, apart from Christina. Stephanie is also head of admissions. I can tell you, I worked on Wall Street, and it's not necessarily true that we practice what we preach, uh, ESG, sustainable investing. And you'll I'll talk a little bit about that. And I hope you go away feeling like, you know, it's easy to, be, to do good and to do the right thing when you're a regulator. The tricky part is when you're in the industry and paid a lot of money, the rewards and incentives are very uh, skewed sometimes. Uh, can you still do the right thing? So I hope I share some war stories with you. Um, and uh, that you'll feel good about uh, doing the right thing and being well-trained through the MBA and well-intentioned as well. So this is not my usual class. I put the slides together for this master class. Uh, I do teach a portfolio management class uh, to MBAs and executive MBAs, and also do quite a bit of executive education. Um, so... The class that I teach goes into portfolio management per se, including the factor models we use, the behavioral models, the risk management tools, and so on. But here I'll just go over a high level and please intersperse it with questions. Um, so I want to first of all introduce my partner in crime, Kola. Uh, he's an MBA student. Um, um, and I wanted, yep, yeah, I wanted him to just say a few words about yourself, Kola, how much good you've done for the world, please. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, I think uh, Christina has said it all. My name is Kola. I'm from Nigeria, Africa. And it's my intention to do good to the world. So I left the entire Africa. I left Canada and left Asia and decided to come to Malaysia. And I can tell you, we are the future, oh, Asia is and Africa. Nice. So it's been very good. Thank you for coming. All right, good. Thank you, Kola. Uh, Kola, you're taking my class this semester, right? The, you already got class participation points. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, oh, thank you very much. Everyone online, I presume, can see me uh, and hear me. Uh, how many do we have online? About 28? Okay, 
So those online, if you have any problems, just raise your hand and we have staff here to take care of you. I also want to introduce my uh, another partner in crime, Jason Yap, who helped me, taught me uh, Menti, which is the poll everywhere. I use poll everywhere. I'm also a professor at Cornell, so I use poll everywhere at Cornell, and I used to be at NUS. We all use poll everywhere. I came here, I turned on my poll everywhere, it doesn't work. They said, must use Menti, higher level, MIT word. So Jason actually transferred all my slides, thanks to him, and he even showed up on a Saturday morning, overtime, you know. He's my uh, academic associate uh, co-lecturer at the portfolio management class this May. Uh, thank you, Jason. Okay, let's get started. So what we'll do today is we'll talk about leadership from the trenches. Uh, slight different way of doing things. When you go to industry, I keep saying Wall Street because I work there. I, I'm actually the reason why I know so many people is because I'm an old man. I left Malaysia in 1982. So you could do the math, okay, after high school. Uh, don't ask me the explicit age, but you can do your calculus, right? Uh, so basically, um, I've been away for a long time and I came back, I'm still Malaysian. I didn't give up my citizenship and I wanted to give back when MIT and Christina and all that called. I said, sure, you know, um, uh, from Singapore, I flew over. I was at NUS Business School. That was my last stint after I came back from New York. Um, uh, that said, um, I want to say that when you go to industry, I think it's a little bit the same here as well, except the fees are a lot higher. Okay, we'll talk about that too. People start with the product. Why? Because the industry says, here's what we're going to sell today. Structured product or some kind of unit trust or mutual fund or some kind of hedge fund or private equity fund. And then there's a big push by industry from the top and everyone is selling that. Have you all been familiar with that too? Yes, push product. I'm not talking about shampoo and all, I'm talking about financial products. Huh? So we should always step back. When you are trained in an MBA program, and if you're trained in finance, you should ask, what is the function I perform before you throw the product? And the function you perform is client driven. What are the needs? What are the goals of the client, whether it's for retirement, whether it's for wealth management, whether it's for education, you ask that first, and then you design the appropriate product. That's a true financial advisor. That's a true financial counselor. Not start with a product. That's a reverse way of doing it. Okay. So I'm going to start with the functions and then ask you through Menti to pick the right product as opposed to starting that way. Um, I don't like to use bad words, but you know, in America, we say ass backwards. Is that okay? Legit? Yeah? Don't do it the ass backwards way. Yeah? Sorry, I, this is a strong word in Malaysia. I apologize. I don't smoke cigars. I don't drink for your info. That's why I'm not in Florida. I'm in KL. Okay. Uh, anyway, then I'll talk about some of the shenanigans that happened. Again, my stories are all from industry uh, in Wall Street, because that's where I was. I was in the middle of all this 2008 crisis, uh, dot com crisis. I entered the industry, I was a professor. I went to Wall Street and that's where I jumped right into the financial crisis. 1999, I went on sabbatical and uh, then dot-com crisis happened. You all don't, may not know this, but dot-com was when we had a bubble. Dot-com is no different from your current bubble that you're seeing in the startup community, Silicon Valley, blah, blah, blah. It's not bad. There have been great companies, Facebook, uh, Amazon, Google, that came out of that uh, bubble. But the point is, there's a lot of herding behavior. We'll try to avoid herding uh, because that creates bubbles. Okay. I'll talk about what causes crisis and then how do we understand and diagnose crisis. At the end of the day, treat yourself as a fiduciary. Don't worry about what regulators say. You must have the right principles and morals. Because sometimes regulators may not know your industry as well. They set the guidelines. By the end of the day, it's your internal moral compass in our industry. And that's what I try to tell my staff. I ran a pretty big group, the largest group at the now defunct Credit Suisse. It was a good group. <laughs> it was a good company. I left in uh, 2009, 10, around that period. Uh, it was still a good company. It was one of the few big banks that did not need to be rescued. Remember? Merrill Lynch, Goldman Sachs, 
uh, Barclays, all of them had to be rescued during the crisis. Credit Suisse didn't need a rescue because they were so risk, um, they'd managed their risks very well. And I was there at the time and I saw how they managed the risk from the top down. The problem with risk is it comes with, what's the word? Risk, reward. If you take lower risk, your reward, lower risk, hello, bro, tell me which company you, I, I want to invest. Huh? Lower reward, right? Higher risk in the expectation sense. There's no guarantee. Expectation forecaster says, higher the risk, long enough time horizon, you may get a higher reward. You could face a crisis, but you expect a higher reward. So the problem was when you stay out of a crisis, you won't earn as much as somebody else who is taking on more risk and the economy recovers. And that's what happened. When Credit Suisse uh, and the rest of the financial sector recovered as of March 2009, that's when the economy turned around, post the crisis, Credit Suisse was more risk managed that kept them out of the crisis that required, that resulted in them not requiring any bailout. But they didn't recover as quickly as Goldman Sachs. Board said, no good get a new CEO. And then it became downhill after that, okay? There's lots of crisis, I won't go over that, but see how a good company can become bad. Barclays, as Krishna pointed out, centuries of experience, one guy, one guy out in Singapore, right? I was in New York at that time, or Boston, you know, he's out in Singapore, keeping a side pocket book where he hid his losses and reported his gains. Gains you see, losses you don't see because that's in the side pocket, okay? So accounting, bad practice, bad auditing, and all that resulted in one solid bank going under. And we have many other cases. Okay, so let's move on. If you have any questions, please raise your hand. And if you are on the uh, Zoom, you can always raise hand there and Jason or, or one of my colleagues will uh, put it up. Okay, first of all, let's start with Menti. We want to start using Menti, the poll. So got your smartphones ready? It should be on silence. Yeah, yeah, pull it up, pull it up. Uh, here, we don't charge SMS, free, okay? A banker is a fellow who lends you his umbrella when the sun is shining, but wants it back the minute it begins to rain. I hope you're not in banking. I used to be in banking, but I'm not trying to disparage the whole industry. But in general, uh, this is what this guy said. All said by one guy. When I was 14, I was astounded at how unintelligent my teachers were. How stupid. Unintelligent means how stupid my teachers were. By the time I turned 21, I was amazed how much they had learned in the last seven years. Uh, the teachers got smart in seven years. I never let schooling interfere with my education, but don't take it too seriously. ASB, you get a good education. Be careful about reading health books. You might die from a misprint. Okay, Who said this? These are the potential answers. Socrates, Kim Jong-il, don't know who he is, Donald Trump, Mark Twain, Kim Kardashian. Okay, this is how you answer. You go to menti.com and use the code 79230658 and Jason will be keeping track. He can see all of you, so you better answer. Yeah, no, no anonymity. Once you enter here, Bank Nagara, you got no anonymity. Just kidding, just kidding. How many seconds should we give them, Jason? Oh. Answers coming out already. It don't show up. Then they bias them. Huh? Already biased class. Huh? Already biased. Don't show them the answers yet. Because you know why? Then they get biased. I'm going to talk about human biases after this. Behavioral biases. Just in case if I, anyone who cannot see the numbers is 79230658. Type it in the chat, yeah. Well, we have a very smart class here. Donald Trump, well, he might be in jail. He might be in jail by the time we finish this quiz. Okay, are we? How many answers do we have, Jason? Jason? Oh, is this just add up the top? I was never good at math. How much is that? About thirty answered. Okay, that's pretty good. Not, not too bad, not too bad. Okay, let's close the poll. So the answer is actually Mark Twain. He said that. 
Um, and uh, basically, he is a very famous writer, quite co co comedic, but he's also a great man. He wrote against um, racial discrimination. He wrote against the Americans plundering China during the Boxer Rebellion, and where they plundered the Summer Palace. He wrote about that. How can you guys going there to, you know, on mission of evangelism or whatever the word is, and then you go plunder and steal their uh, resources and riches. Good man. So he had the, his moral compass right. Okay, very good. We'll close this. That's the right answer, Mark Twain. So I like people like Mark Twain and all the other people who actually make a difference because they're way ahead of their time. Just like in the financial industry, I respect the people who are actually way ahead of their time by being more inclusive. Okay, that means when they have leadership, they don't look at whether you are Asian, European, or male, or female, or whatever the case may be. They pick the best person for the job, okay? So to me, Mark Twain is my, one of my heroes. I've got quite a few. And the reason is because he spoke so strongly against racial discrimination. 19th century, you know, we're not talking 1952 or 1962 when the Civil Rights Act was passed in the U.S. He wrote about it in his books. He wrote about the Chinese rebellion. What does he got to do with China? But he wrote about that. How can you guys go there and plunder the loot of the people of China in the, during the Boxer Rebellion? Anyway, just a side note here. So let's talk about, instead of products, we're going to talk about a functional approach. It's a fundamental tenet in finance that you talk about functions, not institutions or products. Institutions and products are a result of the function. So then you have to ask, yourself, what's the function of the financial system? Okay, that's the question you should ask yourself. We'll go through that. It should be constant across geographies, cultures, income levels. It should provide opportunities across all income levels, across all races, across all um, um, uh, geographies. Now, you may say, oh, America is different from Malaysia. Malaysia is different from Singapore. True. You adjust it according to local customs and cultures and acceptances. But the function itself, retirement, how you save for retirement in Malaysia or Singapore or US or Hong Kong is no different from how you say for retirement in Japan. Same, we all have the same needs. I'll go over that, you follow. But we all get the wrong advice, depending on which country you're in, okay? So you have to be careful there too. We'll talk about it. And you're gonna answer through mentee. Huh? So keep the smartphones fired up. And if you need a charger, you ask our staff, they got chargers for you. Okay, um, institutions are just a natural outgrowth of the function it's supposed to perform. So don't start the other way around. Oh, Goldman Sachs is a great bank. They define what finance is. No, 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 they don't. They don't, they may be gone in 10 years, like bearings and credit Suisse. okay? I don't, I hope you're not from Goldman. I don't mean it that way. I'm just saying metaphorically, right? They almost went under financial crisis. And then after that, they had something called, well, I won't even mention, it's a very sensitive topic uh, in Malaysia, I understand. Okay, so defining functions is very critical. And then only you talk about what's the right product, what's the right institution to serve that need, whether it's an asset manager, whether it's an asset owner, whether it's someone from corporate banking, I think some of you are from corporate banking or investment banking, you need all kinds. A high net worth investor sometimes needs to structure solutions. They don't go to an asset manager to structure solutions. They structure with a corporate or investment banker. You follow what I'm saying? They have the principle. They have the balance sheet to be able to structure. And as a manager, has no balance sheet. They manage clients' money. You follow? So it takes sometimes a whole team to get the right solution. And if you are the financial advisor, assuming you become a financial advisor or you become an investment banker, whatever the case, you are the, um, like the, what do you call it? The person who, conductor. You're like the conductor in an orchestra. Okay. But we also have keen competition, free markets, and so on, that only the best survive. It's the survival of the fittest. It's not an easy job. Jobs get displaced, get transformed. Companies get displaced and transformed. So you've got to be on the cutting edge. And that's why I think 
continuing education is very critical. And Malaysia has it right, in my opinion. I used to teach in NUS uh, Singapore for 13 years, and we had a terrific executive education program for those with a CFA. How many have CFA here? Kola. Yeah, but hello. Israel, show me your certificate. Huh? <laughs> there we go. Okay. Uh, no CFAs. So people with the CFA used to come for this training program uh, in Singapore. The largest delegation we had from Hong Kong, Japan, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, US, from California as well, we had participants. Uh, um, uh, I said Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, Thailand, Indonesia. But the largest contingent always came from Malaysia. And you know why? Because you all have some kind of uh, training uh, budget. Companies are supposed to put money aside, uh, financial institutions. Uh, I think Bank Negara requirement or something, they have to put money aside for training. Again, I keep telling you all, Malaysia is way ahead of the curve on many things. I'm not kidding. I come from America and I come here and I see, whoa, I see more women in leadership positions. I see you have a training budget that now only in America and Singapore they're talking about to create budgets to train people. You had it. So EPF, Kananga, CIMB, RHB, PNB used to send participants, Petronas too, to my Singapore program because they had the budget for it. And the other thing that's an envy of the rest of the world is the external fund management program. It was not Singapore who came up. It's not GIC who came up with it. They told me Malaysia came up with the idea during the 97 crisis. Unfortunately, they had to abandon it. Bank Negara came up with the idea. They had to abandon it because of the crisis. And guess who copied it? Singapore did. And now they have one of the most successful external fund management programs. That created the financial center that Singapore is. Because when you give money out to clients, your reserves money, asset managers, asset owners come and make their headquarters there. So that idea itself came from Malaysia, but Singapore implemented it, and now they've become a very big financial center. So all I'm saying to you is don't give up hope. Don't go to Florida and start smoking cigars. Stay here and work some more, okay? Um, okay, very good. So these are the functions. Let's go over the functions. Can we give them the slides so they don't need to copy and take pictures? Uh, how does it work? I'm... Oh, okay, you'll share the recording. Okay, so please don't worry about taking pictures. We'll get you all these things later. Okay, the first is to provide ways to transfer economic resources through time, geographies, cultures, and so on. You want to save up for tuition in 10 years from now. Okay, how do you do that? You need some kind of investment vehicle. Correct? What's the right type of vehicle? 100% in growth equities? Or is it 100% in Malaysian government securities? Or is it 100% in Islamic sukuk bonds? Right? Should it be corporate bonds or governments? Uh, should it be conventional or should it be Islamic? You have so many ways in which you can implement it. Okay? So that's one of the functions. Intergenerational risk and reward transfer. Because the market is a huge and deep place. The market can absorb risk that you cannot. So you offload the risk, you buy the product, which can help you spread the risk and return around. Okay, so that's the first function. Second function, to provide ways of managing risk, which is tied up to the first one, because you're getting, you're being able to transfer your wealth across time and geographies. You can move money from here to Singapore, to Japan, whatever the case is, say for good reasons, not for money laundering, <laughs> for good reasons, you can send money over for investments, for education or whatever, because of the first function, but you also got to manage the risk. You don't want to wake up 10 years from now when you saved up for that yacht you wanted to buy in 10 years and find out, oh my gosh, the market crashed by 30%. How to buy the yacht? or how to get the tuition, how to pay the tuition fee, you're right? So it'd also be managing your risk. And we'll talk about that as we come along. Risk management is critical. You know, when I talk to some very famous people in this region about inflation in 2012, I wrote a lot about it. And they call me up into the office and say, why are you talking about inflation? It's a thing of the past. We're in a new normal. New normal, that was the word then, 2012. You can do a Google search about inflation. Just type Joe Cherin inflation. If a professor from Indiana doesn't show up, it'll be me. Okay. 
I don't know why chat GPT, you type Joe Chair and someone in Indiana comes up. So chat GPT is always wrong. Remember that. I'm the one who they should show up, you know. Anyway, so basically what happened was inflation's gone, we are new normal, we are lower interest rate regime, productivity, all that stuff. And then suddenly everyone panicked. Why? Inflation is very high. You know how high inflation went in America? How high the number? About 12%. 12% per annum annualized. That's a lot of inflation. So what does that mean? If I have $1 today, what is it worth in terms of purchasing power in a one year? It's worth 12% less. Huh? It's worth 12% in terms of purchasing power. That's a lot of purchasing. Now you compound it. How many of you know time value of money? Yeah, there we go. So you compound it over 30 years. You can really erode away your buying power. Okay? So you got to be careful about that. It's for clearing and settle, settlement of payments. And you can use cryptocurrency. I know half of you in the room use cryptocurrency to settle your payments. No, 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 no. It's okay, okay. Uh, what do you use? Touch and go, like me. Touch and go. I use touch and go. I'm really happy by touch and go. But now people are complaining, give other options. I just loaded touch and go and now saying give other options. I hope they don't take away touch and go because it's so convenient, you know, everywhere you can use T and G, whatever it's called. But anyway, that's a form of payment system. You can use do it now. Another fantastic system. I use that for my banking, do it now. Um, and so on, right? You've got a lot of, or you can use your old traditional greenbacks. Uh, not greenbacks, here it's different colors. Greenbacks is US. Uh, different colors here, uh, red, yellow, green, all that. Yeah. So basically that's, Another reason that you have the financial system, pooling of resources and the subdividing of ownership in various enterprises. What's this talking about? Sounds very esoteric. What is this talking about? I, sorry? No, I'm talking about financial markets. Maybe. Stock market, bursa. Yeah, stock market. Okay, you divide ownership. Because you can't buy Highcom. Does Highcom still exist? Noah. Oh, okay, sorry, sorry. I've been away for too long. Give me a good big company. TNB. Still exists, right? TNB, yeah. Huh? Or Maybank, yeah. You can't buy Maybank or TNB, but you can take a fractional ownership in that. Okay? So that's the reason for that. Now think about crypto and all that stuff. Have you all heard of security tokens? You have heard of security tokens. Security tokens are collateralized crypto, crypto assets, collateralized. When it's collateralized, it means there's something underlying guaranteeing its value. Okay? So just think about it. You need to be a, what's called an accredited investor to buy hedge funds and private equity. Correct? You know what it means, right? That means you have to have a certain net worth or certain income level to be able to buy private equity or, or hedge funds. Not unit trust. I'm talking about specialized vehicles that are called hedge funds and private equity, okay? Carlisle, uh, Citadel, Blackstone, these names, okay? But think about this. If I were able to take, carve out $100 million of Blackstone private equity, best private equity funds, okay? Put it into a special purpose vehicle and issue security tokens against that. It's kept in a vehicle and it's audited, it's monitored, it's everything. That means there's no one playing games, it's there in a special vehicle. And then I issue security tokens against that. And each token you can buy and sell on your digital exchange. You all have one in Singapore, Malaysia, I read. Uh, Bursa has started, or somebody has started a, a digital exchange here, licensed. If you could buy and sell that, now everyone can buy piece of Blackstone or Carlisle or Citadel because it's in small chunks. Fractional ownership. That's what we mean here. So it's not just about Bursa or about bond markets. It's also about democratizing the whole financial industry. We're not there yet because regulators around the world, Singapore, Malaysia, America, are not comfortable with the idea. But Singapore, after many years of prodding, they finally decided to do that they carved out their thermosic private equity fund, put into a bond structure called Azalea. And that Azalea, after five or six years, is now being offered 
on a digital exchange called ADDX. I forget what's the new name, ADDX. You can buy smaller chunks of it and trade it. Okay? So what we talked about 10 years ago is becoming true. It takes a while for the regulators and others to get used to it. I don't know what's the trading volume on it, but basically this to me is innovation, democratization of the highest order. Because what's my goal? The hard lenders should also be able to participate in additional risk reward uh, opportunities without exposing their entire wealth uh, to risk. You follow? Now you can buy small amounts. So whoever told you crypto trading and crypto assets is not useful, it doesn't serve a function, not necessary. It can serve a function, okay? But of course, we've got to bring down the energy levels love, because they use up a lot of energy right now from what I understand. Okay, we have to move on. Price discovery, information. How do Citadel, Blackstone, and all these famous hedge funds invest? They are using information from balance sheet, from macro data, from volume, volatility, order flow, from the Bursa and from, SC, from New York Stock Exchange. So they are actually using information. So financial markets have another function, information discovery, or what we call price discovery to make sure you don't overpay for an asset or underpay. Underpaying is always good, right? buy low, sell high, right? But you wanna pay a fair price, okay? Definitely not overpay for the asset. And we tend to overpay for the asset, especially when we have these herding behavior. Chase returns. We see that all the time, chase returns. And then you have concentration risk. I'll talk about the Kindleberger effect. That's called the... Um, um, uh, Minsky effect. Everyone's chasing, everyone concentrates, and then something happens, you have systematic problem, the whole sector falls value, okay? And finally, incentive problems. When you have a principal and agent, have you all heard of adverse selection and moral hazard? It's like SVB, right? Banks, not necessarily SVB because they were actually invested quite safely. They just had bad policy in the sense they have so many startups and so many people of highly concentrated activities in the bank. And when they suffered, the bank suffered. It's not that like they took on much risk or anything. There are banks who took on a lot of risk, like Lehman. Okay? Why? Because when you take risk, you get higher. Higher what? Higher? Hey, you're not supposed to answer. Higher what? He's already got an MBA. Higher. Higher reward, right? Higher risk, higher reward. When you get higher reward in industry, financial industry, higher in Wall Street, you get higher compensation, or we call it bonus. Bonus, okay? So what would you do? Take more risk, make more reward for the company, get higher bonus. Sometimes things go wrong. That risk you took blows up. Nick Leeson blows up. Correct? Then what happens? Company blows up. Well, you blow up or not? Do you blow up? No, you don't. In Wall Street, you just go to the next bank. Yeah, all in one Wall Street, World Trade Center. I mean, the old World Trade Center. You just move. It was truth. You don't have to worry. That's an incentive problem. They could just walk over to the next bank because they were stars. Doesn't matter you blew up the bank you, or the book, it doesn't matter. You can move to another company. That creates a perverse incentive problem. You get rewarded for taking risk, no penalties for uh, failing. You follow. Now, Nick Leeson is already probably a grandfather, or probably is he still alive? I don't know. He gives talks. He's already left jail. He's no longer in jail. He's actually now giving talks about how to do the right thing. Yeah. Yeah, you see, make money when in the markets and then make money educating people how not to do things the way he did. Uh, yeah, he went to jail, not short. I think it was at like 12 years. He also had cancer. He had, had a few things. He had cancer. He was in hospital and so on. So the question was, what happened to Nick Leeson? He paid the penalty, but there are very few people who actually paid the penalty from the mutual fund crisis that I'll talk about in 2001 
what we call the late trading and market timing scandal in, New in America, no one went to jail. Okay? Madoff did go to jail for his Ponzi scheme. He did go to jail. But very few people went to jail. Even 2008, 09, not many people went to jail for their, whatever they did. Misrepresenting and mis-selling securities. That's actually against the fiduciary act of the Securities Exchange Commission. But nobody went to jail for it because it's very hard to prove. Okay. In fact, when I was in, um, um, we had a training program that I took our CEOs from Singapore over to America every year. And we had the judge, uh, Judge Holwell, fantastic judge, federal court judge, federal, not state. Um, he gave a talk to our students, our CEOs. Uh, this was an executive education program. And they asked him, he was the judge who put two very famous people behind bars. Uh, have you all heard of Galleon Capital? They had an office in Singapore, Galleon, the hedge fund. Do you know the name Rajaratnam? The hedge fund manager worth $8 billion who went to jail for 50,000 US dollars. Worth $8 billion with the B, yeah? He went to jail for $50,000, just to make $50,000. The Goldman Sachs scandal. Rajat Gupta, who was on the board, McKinsey managing partner, called him and told him what was going on the board, allegedly. Rajat, uh, um, uh, Rajaratnam allegedly put some trades, made fifty dollars or $100,000. $8 billion. He just made fifty hundred thousand. dollars He spent 11 years in jail. Just came out. Okay? Or maybe he's still in jail, I'm not sure. So the judge said he couldn't believe it. And this guy was not greedy. He actually donated a lot of his money away to charity. He was a very, very generous guy. He said, I can't believe it. Why did this guy risk his imprisonment, insider trading, it's called insider trading, for just fifty to hundred thousand dollars? It has to be greed or something that's driving you or competent. I, I, he couldn't understand. Judge Hallwell, Richard Hallwell. Fantastic judge. So he said, unfortunately, he's the only guy we were able to catch on Wall Street on insider trading. Why? Because he was being tapped. Uh, FBI had a tap on him for something else. Not for insider trading, for something else. There was an accusation that he was funding some terrorists, which was not true. He was not doing that, for sure, guaranteed. They said he was not. But because some rival of his said he was funding some terrorist organization, they tapped him. And when they tapped him, they heard him talking about gold. And that's how they caught him for insider trading. Quite unfortunate. But the judge said, that's the lesson I had to teach. He was the only guy we caught. I had to show, give a lesson to everyone. This is not right. This is not fair. It's against the law. You have to obey the law, even though you're worth $8 billion. Sent him to jail for like 12 years or something. Rajaratnam of Galian Capital. That's the story. I always use these stories because I say, look, you know, the penalties are so large. Why do you want to do these things? You know, do the right thing. You'll, you'll also be rewarded. You'll be rewarded. Don't worry. The world is a fair place. But you won't be rewarded in a totally uh, unscrupulous way. So now, what are the three things? Given we've got the functions down, what are the three things? Diversification. What is diversification? Those online, can you, if anyone wants to speak, you also use the chat box, I guess, and answer and let me know, Jason or, or Hamid, if there's anyone saying uh, something. What is diversification? This is the easiest. Spreading out the risk. Don't put all your eggs in one basket, right? Oh, yeah. Um, Sita, right? Oh, what happened? You got no mica. Spreading out risk. Okay, Sita just said spreading out the risk. That means don't put all your eggs in one basket. Diversify. Whether it's your career, whether it's your um, uh, assets, whatever it is, you diversify. It helps because it reduces risk. Hmm? That's a statistically can show it reduces risk. But is that the only function or principle of finance? Everyone talks about this. What are the other principles? I give you a hint. There we go. Very good. What is hedging, Sita? Uh, put on your mic. I paid Sita to say this answer. Yeah. Go ahead. 
um, basically taking a sort of like protecting a position. For example, if interest rates are going to rise or interest rates are going to drop, you buy uh, derivatives products. Yeah. If foreign Very good. Rate, banks do that. Central banks do that. They enter into swap agreements. So if interest rates go up or currencies go up, they can swap it out with another central bank. They're called FX swaps, central bank FX swaps. So they serve a function, but the whole idea is to reduce the uncertainty about the outcome. I'm a farmer. I want to sell my rice, rice farmer, sell my rice at 100 ringgit, whatever the cost is, per 100 kg, five years from now. I don't want any uncertainty because my costs are the same. I've got to pay the same people, the fertilizer and all that stuff. I want $100, no uncertainty. You enter into a hedging contract, a futures contract, it's called. They exist, they're products. So I have no uncertainty. But to get that uncertainty resolved, that means to, be, to eliminate the uncertainty, you give up any gains. Huh? If the price of rice goes up, the spot price of rice five years from now goes up, you still get $100. If the spot price of rice goes down, you still get $100. You benefit because the price of rice went down, but you still get $100. Or think of palm oil, whatever the case may be. So both ways, you don't gain or lose. It's fixed. You follow. Okay, so that's called hedging. Give up the gains to pay for the losses. When you enter a swap contract with two central banks, Federal Reserve and Bank Nagara, and they have multilateral swaps as well with ASEAN and China, Japan, Korea, they have multilateral swaps. When they enter into these swaps, it costs nothing to enter. Nothing, zero, because they will price it such that the swap rate, the fixed rate, is a, going to be set such that the gains will pay for the losses based on information we have today. And that uses the yield curve, the spread, and all that stuff, credit spread curve, and so on. Very complicated, very mathematical, but you can do it using financial markets. Price discovery, that's very important. What's the last thing you think? Anyone should guess? What's the last function of principal? Um, you can either transfer. You, you can't answer everything. Hold on. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's okay, Sita. Yeah, but anyone else? Uh, thanks for trying, Sita. I don't know her. She just said hello to me and gave me a name. That's all. No, no, we didn't plant her here, okay? Anyone else? Third principle. What do you do when you want to protect your house from floods or insurance? Insurance. What does insurance do? If the car is a total wreck, you get paid the value of the car, right? If nothing happens to the car, you get nothing, okay? So you're protecting yourself against downside risk. Let's say you have a house. If the house, something tragic happens, you're protected, you get a payback. But if nothing happens to the house, the value goes up, you can participate the full amount of the rise in value of the house, correct? That's insurance. But for insurance, you must pay a premium. It costs you something, it's not free. Got to pay a premium. Financial markets also, you can get insurance. They're called put and calls. You can buy puts and calls or derivatives to give you that insurance. So when you talk to a banker, they're putting together a structure that includes either a futures contract or a swap contract or a put or a call that allows you to hedge against different types of risk. Diversification is for free in the sense that apart from paying commissions for the stock, you buy a basket or you buy a mutual fund from, give me a big mutual fund company. Uh, no, no, it's Malaysia. But don't, don't always talk America. We are Malaysia now. Huh? Public mutual, public mutual, okay? If you buy a public mutual, mutual fund, let's say the, what's the Malaysian index called? Uh, FTSE Bursa? No, what? KLCI, yeah? The KLCI. It's a diversified index, correct? The diversification costs you nothing, but the fact that they are putting this package together for you costs you a management fee. Okay, we won't talk about sales load and all that stuff, but this is a management fee for them to manage the portfolio for you, the KLCI portfolio. So diversification comes for free, except for the cost. Everything has transaction costs. I won't talk about transaction costs so much. Okay, 
Yeah. Oh, tail risk hedging. Philip, can you please identify yourself? Is oh. You can unmute and share if you want to, uh, Philip. Yeah, hi, no. Uh, uh, because um, he was asking about the what you buy insurance. Uh, insurance yeah. in the end, if nothing drastic happens, you're just you'll just be paying premiums, basically. So I would say that's more towards like um just form of tail risk hedging, right? You're paying for something yes. that most probably won't happen, but if it happens, you are glad you have it. There, there we go. So you cannot have an element of regret. Philip, are you where are you based in um uh, are you in Bangsa? No, I'm I'm actually based in Kuching. I'm from Sarawak. Oh, oh wow, yeah. Sarawak. A country I got to I, I, not a country, a state I got to visit. So hope to see you when you're when I come over to Sarawak. Uh, otherwise you can come take the program here. Yeah, sounds good. I, I, I have plans actually. I'm looking oh, forward to that. Good, good, good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but uh, anyway, that was a very good answer. Tail risk hedging. Okay, that's what options are used for insurance. But you got to pay a premium. You can't tell the banker, sorry, I don't want to pay. I want free. Cannot. You don't get car insurance for free. You don't get house insurance for free. Why should this financial product insurance, or as Philip calls it, tail risk hedging be free? Right? Okay. So those are three things, insurance. And now I'm going to show you graphically how it works. Okay? This is diversification. Risk reward frontier. When you take an MBA class here, Kola, did they teach you here? This? Are you sure? Huh? You got your tuition's worth. Huh? Okay, this is called the what frontier? Efficient frontier. Okay, by the way, this master class is not included in your tuition. Huh? I'll collect later. <laughs> He's buying me lunch for this. Um, diversification is efficient frontier. You have to move to the northwest frontier. Northwest. Increase the return. So look at it. I don't have a pointer, but basically, for the same risk, if I stay at a point here, and that's what Plabic Blank and Kananga and RHB and May Bank Asset Managers, that's what they're doing, the asset managers. They're trying to take you from a point which is inferior. For this risk, I should be getting this reward according to diversification theory. This is mathematical. This is nothing to do with uh, um, uh, intuition. This is statistics. I can improve it by taking on a basket of securities. That means I want to be on the efficient frontier. I get a higher return for the risk I'm taking. You follow? Or if I want 4% risk uh, return, I shouldn't be taking on this much risk. Unless your company, la, you, you can offer low reward, uh, low risk, but higher return. <laughs> What's your name? Parul. Parul, yeah. Parul's my friend now. So basically, you know, you cannot get for this return. Uh, you know, you shouldn't be getting for this return, take on so much risk. Huh? You have to be here. Lower risk, this return. So it's like an optimal frontier. Now, of course, in reality, you may not get, be able to reproduce this curve because of transaction costs, because of management fees, because of slippage, right? Slippage is when you buy something, the price goes down or goes up. Huh? Depending on whether you're buying, it goes up. If you're selling, it goes down. You've noticed that sometimes? When you have to buy, the price goes up. When you sell, the price goes down. Those are what's called illiquid stocks, illiquid names. That's what happens. So that's diversification. This is hedging. You see? Distribution, uncertainty, Gaussian curve. How many of you remember your Gaussian curve from high school? Maybe primary school. Huh? Called normal distribution, univariate distribution. Huh? So you are trying to mitigate the uncertainty of the spread in the returns, and you want to get certainty, which is a fixed price. I want to sell my rice or my palm oil at a fixed price. I enter into a futures commodity contract at Bursa. They have oil palm futures, commodity palm oil futures. That's how I do it. Okay. As a palm oil plantation owner, I can fix my price by entering into a futures contract. That's called hedging. Give up the gains to protect myself from the downside. The third graph is insurance. Protect my losses, participate in the gains. Protect my losses, but still participate in my gains. This is reward, okay? Think of the distribution as the risk. I have to pay a premium, follow? 
Everyone online can also see, right? Good. Okay, now we have a quiz. Time for a quiz. You know my president, Sanjay Sarma, world class. You know your RFID that never works at the toll booth? He invented that. But he said Malaysia used the substandard one. His technology is very good. Globally, it's very good. But he's basically the writer. He's a rock star. I'm telling you, we are so lucky to have him. Unfortunately, he just went back to Boston. If not, he would be here too. Uh, professor Sanjay Sarma, a uh, engineering professor from MIT, chair professor, vice president of MIT. He's now our president. And basically, um, um, why did I bring up his name? Oh, yeah, he told me, he told me, uh, he told us, the whole class, that the attention span of a five-year-old kid is 20 minutes. The attention span, those of you who have five-year-old children, you know, attention span, MBA prospect is five minutes. So you must give a lot of quizzes. Huh? I'm just joking. I'm just saying, you got to keep the class engaged. So Jason has helped me with Menti. Is it up or not yet? Okay, so now you're going to Menti. Okay, now you have to answer. Eliminating exposure to bad outcomes, that still risk, as Philip said, by paying an upfront premium. What is that called? Hedging, diversification, punting, hustings, insurance. Same code. Yeah, menti.com and the same code. Don't quit the app, yeah, because it will use the same code. Yeah, don't quit the app. Refresh, refresh, start, start Menti. Sorry, sorry, we have to start Menti. Okay, now you can see. Huh? Refresh your smartphone, refresh. Oh, Ah. okay, okay, here we go. Hey, don't show the answers, don't show the answers. Hide the answers. Yeah, hide the results. No, normally there's a thing here that says don't, dis don't uh, display the results. There's something on the lower left. Yeah, that one. Yes. Hey, Jason, teach me and I teach him back. <laughs> Sharing is caring. There we go, Maru. Good one. Okay. We give them about three more seconds and then you're on it. You have to be fast. Huh? This class, you'll be fast. Okay, let's go. Let's see what's your answer. Insurance. Very good. I, I'll ignore this one. One person. Uh, because that could be Cola. You do that, yeah. Uh, uh, insurance. See, Cola's checking whether I'm awake or not. Okay, so let's move to the next question. Eliminating exposure to bad outcomes, that's a tail risk, by giving up possibility of gains. What's that called? Hunting, hunting, insurance, punting, diversification, hedging. So you see, you've got to put your thinking caps on, huh? We are recording all the answers. Huh? This is like a GMAT. Huh? If you don't pass, you cannot come to ASB. Okay, go. Excellent, excellent. Next one. Optimally balancing risk and return trade-offs to move the efficient frontier in the northwest direction. Go. This is easy. If your app is on, you just can answer it very quickly. So you, now you recall. You'll never forget that you learned this in this class. Okay, go. What's the answer? Should be diversification. Perfect. Excellent, guys. You guys are doing very well. In fact, you can um, uh, waiver my class. When you come do MBA, I give you permission. Okay, now, Hamid, am I allowed to do waiver? Cannot. Uh. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. If I had the right, I got no authority. As you know, I'm just a professor. They control the agenda. Who can waive my class because you answered Three very important questions, correct? Okay. First question, we're going to use functions to define products, not the AB way. I won't use bad words. AB means, you don't forget, huh? American word, AB. They forgot the idea what it means. Okay. The average investor is concerned about three fundamental issues during retirement. Let's say I pulled a bunch of uh, uh, retire. Uh, uh, people saving for retirement. I went to the EPF membership board and asked them, can you please give me this, ask them to ask what's your most important issues? And the answer, we pulled them and the three most important things they said was receiving a reasonable level payout every month 
in retirement. So when I retire the age of 68, or I don't know, here, 65, retirement 65, 65. So if I retire the age of 65, Singapore is 65, here I think it's also 62 or 65, 62 or 60, okay. Um, I think you got to live long, you got to work longer, sorry. It's going to come, I know it's going to come. Uh, I want to receive a reasonable level payout every month to pay for my expenses, retirement expenses, for my food, for my housing. Let's say I own the house, so I don't need housing anymore. Uh, for a little bit of leisure, travel, you know, um, shopping, healthcare, very important, healthcare. All these things I need to pay for. What's the best way to do it? In the old days, they call it a pension scheme. You get a pension. What's a pension? A payout. So in what has changed? No more pension. You have to save for yourself. You got to do it yourself in the EPF and CPF in Singapore, the MPF in Hong Kong, and the 401k in America. Do it yourself. What do you need? Level payout. It should last as long as the retiree leaves. You don't want to get up at the age of 92 and find out, oh, ran out of money, I'm still alive. Bad. You know what I mean? It's okay it's, you know, to live long, but run out of money, that's bad. Very bad. It's a serious problem in Malaysia. Okay, so it's not a laughing matter. It should be indexed to my cost of living. Hey, hello. You just told me 18% per year or 12% per year my erosion of purchasing power. I got to keep up with that, right? So in America, a lot of the payouts and in UK, they are indexed to inflation. Huh? That means if I buy a 401k retirement annuity, it's indexed to inflation. Okay? I have a lot of that product. I even have what's called treasury inflation protected securities. I buy what's called a laddered bond portfolio. What's a laddered bond portfolio? From 98, when they started issuing the treasury inflation protected securities, that's called TIPS. I buy a TIPS, right? You know that. I buy a certain chunk, put it in my portfolio. 30 year bond. What happens? Over 30 years, it earns the inflation. Guess what they told me in 2005? Oh, this professor is a stupid professor. Inflation is so low. Why are you worry? You know, but what is inflation? 12%, right? So what is the interest I'm earning? It's the real rate, which was 3.4% in 1998. 3.4% real rate, fixed over 30 years, because it's a bond. Every year, they adjust to inflation. For the last 15 years, it was earning zero, because inflation was very low in America. But what was it earning the last year and now? 12 plus 3.4%. That's a lot. Hey, I took my class, my own class. That's why. That's a lot. That's a lot. As long as the US government doesn't go bankrupt, I'm okay. Correct? So the point is, that's what hedging. I'm not saying I'm a super smart guy. This was told to me. It was taught to me in the 90s. Happened to be an MIT professor who told me I should do this. Because he said, you're going to Wall Street. You've got all these high stock market volatility and correlation your income and all that, you should be buying safe securities. So I didn't come up with this idea. He told me you should go buy this, MIT professor. Huh? Yes. I, I have a question. I'm go. curious. With all of these top brains in the US, and yeah. that, why are economists not able to solve the inflation problem? OK. Uh, the top brains, I have to argue with you, maybe not necessary. <laughs> um, that part is a bit debatable. There are a lot of very smart people but the problem is there's a big disconnect between the smart and the implementers. You need to get them to work together. That's the most important thing. And that's why people who work in academics or work in the uh, uh, ivory tower should also be working closely with the industry and regulators and policymakers. That's what we, I believe. They need to work together so that we can have better outcomes. If you look at the world today, the situation is really bad, right? Political leaders, economic leaders, all of them are doing such, making such bad decisions. You ask yourself, where are all the smart people, right? They're there. It's just that there's not enough collaboration. But that said, inflation is not easy to solve, right? What's driving this inflation? Uh, scarcity due to what? Supply chain. We started the pandemic, then we had all these wars, and we have all these political problems, half of it being fighting with China which was supplying the rest of the world, right? 
So that's created a serious supply chain problem. And because we've reached this new equilibrium of protectionism and inward lookingness, obviously what they taught you in economics 101, that free trade brings about more efficient outcomes, it's true. When you have no free trade, this is what happens. Inflation becomes a problem. When you don't talk peace, where's the United Nations? People are fighting wars. You don't hear the UN Secretary General saying anything. In the old days, they'll say, stop the war, stop the war. Now, no one's saying stop the war. So give more arms, give more arms. It's going to cause inflation to continue going up. Grain supply is being disrupted. Cheap electronics and cheap uh, parts from China are being banned in America. It's not a solution. I wear Huawei. Everything I wear is Huawei. My phone, can you show them? It's Huawei. Yeah, Huawei, proof, evidence, Huawei, Huawei. When I go to America, I have to be careful. I hide my Huawei because they may arrest me if they find out I'm a driver of Huawei. You know what I mean? I'm just kidding. They won't do that. I, I'm, I'm a permanent resident of the US. But what I'm saying is this stupidity, right? Policymakers should learn how to get along. Then inflation will come down. You know, uh, Productivity should improve. All these things. Chat GPT is taking over our world. Right? Chat GPT is a serious threat. You know, to workers, to educators, to students, to everyone, right? But if you, I just gave a question to Chat GPT to my friends in Singapore this morning. They're my walking buddies. I can't walk with them now because I live here. So I asked them, they said, oh, Chat GPT, get this answer, that answer, blah, blah, blah. I said, ask Chat GPT this question. And they asked, and the answer was not perfect. It gets first order answers right. Second order that requires more thinking, it cannot answer correctly unless you prompt it to to go look here, go look there. You follow? So there's still hope for us. The chat GPT is only first order smart, not second order smart. You follow? If you want to know the question, buy me lunch, I'll tell you what the question is. Yeah, it's about retirement. Yes. Uh, use the mic, yeah. Um, do you think the challenge of uh, fighting inflation right now has a lot to do with the delay action from the Fed, right? Because for a long time, they have been uh, attributing it to a uh, transitory uh, inflation, right? Yeah. Yeah. They think that when the supply problem is solved after the pandemic, it will come down, but they could have overlooked the amount of money that's being printed. Yeah. yeah. So I think the, I don't want to put any, since we're on sacred ground here, I don't want to put any blame on policymakers and regulators or central banks, but part of the problem was self inflicted with all that easy money, particularly the Fed. They come and tell us and lecture us, oh, when you have a crisis, you got to cut your uh, expenses. You got to close down your companies. You got to do that. But when America has the same problem, pump money, rescue this, rescue that, uh, you know, bail out the banks. No same treatment, double standards, follow. So there was a big effort, what they call the green spend put. It started a green spend put. What's a put option, uh, Philip? The right. Philip, you spell hedging wrong. <laughs> Two marks off. The right. What's the what's the put option? Green spend put option. What's the principle? Diversification, hedging, insurance. It's insurance. Green spend was Alan Green spend. Yeah. Any time markets were rocky in the nineties, two thousand period, Green spend will say something. Markets will stabilize. They call it the green spend put because he say, I will supply, I will stabilize the market. Not his function to stabilize markets, but then financial stability came into the equation as well. Okay. So they say under the guise of financial stability, they would prop up the market. So when you have a green spend put option, remember your downside is protected. What happens? It's shown by academics in America and around the world that then you can have price bubbles. A very famous professor called Robert Jaro showed, he's at Cornell, how bubbles can form when you have this artificial, even though it's not implemented, he just speaks. That was implicit. Then we have explicit saving of banks and all that through pumping of rescue money and uh, printing of money and all stuff to keep the economy going. When the, everyone's flush with, with flush with liquidity, the money has to go somewhere. So it goes into the most risky assets, the ones that may not deserve that amount of money. So suddenly they go up and we have what's called the peso premium problem. What's the peso premium? 
I don't mean to put any uh, um, uh, South American country on the hook here. It's just called in economics the peso premium. No news is good news. Bum, 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 it goes up. And then suddenly some bad news happens. Pandemic. Um, Lehman cannot meet its obligations. Boom, it crashes. So even though the likelihood of a crash happening diminishes, the probability is not that high of a crash happening. But because of the bubble, the magnitude of the crash would be a lot bigger. You follow? So that's the problem. So basically what's happened is Professor Aswat Damodaran at NYU, one of the most famous professors in the world because he's very popular. He's handsome also, that helps. The thing is, Aswat Damodaran at NYU is very popular globally. I think many of you watch his videos. He's a, one of the best speakers on valuation. He just put out an article, it was featured in kind of Forbes and so on, about the excesses in the markets. And he lists down all the excesses that's causing this bubble. And he says, we ask for it. And a lot of times, it's driven by the governments, you know, forcing central banks, oh, no, no, you got to prop up money. And remember, Donald Trump was calling up the central bank and saying, you got to support, don't do this. I've got an election coming up. Hey, hello. Election and central bank function is different things, you know, but that's how we mix things up together. So we are paying the price. Yeah. It's, it's interesting that uh, in the recent um, FOMC meeting, yeah. usually there's a Q&A session right, yeah. after half an hour after that. And uh, the, um, uh, the participant actually asked, uh, uh, Powell? asked Powell this question, right? Uh, does Biden calls you? He says never. Yeah. <laughs> Only Donald Trump calls. Yeah, <laughs> only Donald Trump. I mean, Biden, Obama, they know the separation. But they have lunch every week. Huh? The president lunch with the central bank governor. Just lunch, you know, just conversation. On, but they're supposed to apply pressure. So that's the way it's supposed to work. Um, what, what is the better? People will probably speculate that Biden does not know what's going on. Biden doesn't know what's going on. Why do you say that? And you think that Donald Trump knows what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> By extension, you have uh, Janet Yellen beside him. Beside yeah. him uh, no, the important thing is you need advisor. good advisors. Yeah, you yeah, need yeah. very good, sound advisors. And I think he's surrounded by pretty smart people. But still, I don't view America as a leader anymore, to be honest with you. I mean, I lived there since 1982, and I should be quite proud of my existence there. But I can tell you, we are leaderless right now. America just doesn't have any. And I look at the slate of People trying to run for politics in America, no hope. You know, so it's up to Asians to wake up and say, "Look, yeah, let's find a new like equilibrium." So much potential, even for the Republican. Uh, that's why they have to rely on Donald Trump in the past, and now he's getting into trouble. Yeah. It, yeah. Well, I think a lot of it's driven by self-interest. You know, it's a lot of driven by self-interest. You mustn't forget the political action groups, the lobbyists, the self-interested groups. You know. That's why I say, even our industry, we can't get our industry right. What do you expect of politicians? I mean, I don't mean to disparage politicians, but the fact is, we have to get it right. So at the end of the day, I always say, what do I need to do to make this place a better place? I can impact the financial industry. I can give talks. I can advise governments, and I do. You know, that's how I impact. And because of that, the CPF in Singapore is a much better system now because we are part of the team that advise the government how to improve the CPF. You cannot be kiasu, you know? You gotta help the people who are poor. You know what I mean? Singapore very kiasu, you know the word kiasu? No. You said, no, you must have programs to support those who are falling out of the track. You can't do meritocracy, meritocracy all the time. You know, it's the people who need support have to be supported. So, but the CPF should not be for the, you don't give the subsidies to the rich. You follow, let them take the risk, let them do the things. And the second thing is, I said, you must have a lifetime annuity product. They have CPF life now. Everyone can buy CPF life. Life annuity. One thing I try to get them to do, uh, I hope I'm not violating any official secrets act of Singapore here, but never mind. They're still my friend. Inflation indexing. I try to get inflation indexing the product. No inflation indexing. Unfortunate. And now you look at it. COE, you know, the COE, I'm not trying to disparage Singapore, I'm just telling you, this is the reality. 2012, you tell me, no, no, it's a thing of the past. Now look at the COE price. You know what COE is? The option to buy a car is at $120,000. You know, 
just to get the option to buy a car is 120,000 uh, Singapore dollars. To buy a house, it's through the roof. It's so expensive that they're putting cooling measures just two days ago. So the thing is, you can't predict where things are going to go. You just got to protect. And as a government, you have to take care of your citizens. And that's what we are trying to do here. A group of us, not just me, to make sure that we redesign things so that everyone's safe in retirement. Yeah. Well, You're not a regulator, are you, by any chance? No, 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 I'm not. Oh, okay. Just I'm checking. Financial education. Oh, okay. So, yeah. uh, one of the common questions I get is about the USD devaluation uh, yeah. risk, right? Would you have time to cover that? Because I think it's a very important aspect to, uh, to, to protect, right? Rather than... US uh, dollar devaluation. Yeah, yeah. Not just the uh, inflation because of the BRICS initiative. Uh, I know it's not easy to, you know, remove US dollar from a reserve currency, but it's also not impossible, right? Yeah. In the past, it's always end up with a war. But, you know, if if we were to uh, just protect against inflation, you know, what if something happened to, I mean, there's so, already so much talk about USD devaluation. How do yeah. we protect? So the thing is that the thing about the US dollar that people are talking about is they're saying they're substitute currencies and yeah. substitute uh, vehicles. But you know, you have to understand that according to SWIFT records, uh, the yeah. payments records, about 90 plus percent of transactions still use the US dollar. Okay, so that's not going to go away. There's a guy called Professor Eswa Prasad. I don't know if you've heard of him. He's written a lot on the US dollar and he's a China expert. In fact, he advises the Chinese government. He used to be at IMF, now he's a professor. You should read his book, Eswa Prasad, The Strength of the Dollar. He gives a cogent argument Eswar, E-S-W-A-R, Prasad, out in America. He basically has given a cogent argument why the US dollar will remain strong for a long time. I mean, at least the denomination of uh, exchange uh, primary. But here's my argument. And I've written about this before too. In, you can search in Business Times in Singapore or something. Back in the early days, why don't Asian countries settle among themselves by bypassing the dollar? Just do it, central bank to central bank. Create swaps. They already have swap lines. There's already FX swap lines. Make it permanent so that when I buy something at BNBB, the, when you settle with the, the central banks will settle it automatically. You don't have what's called a round trip cost. Malaysian ringgit to US dollar, US dollar to RMB, and vice versa when you reverse the trade. That's a transaction cost. So. But it's already very pervasive right now. Even Argentina is settling in the RMB. Yeah. No, I know, but it's still not enough. It's not enough. Uh, what I'm saying is ASEAN and Asia should do more of these things. They are doing that, but they should have done this ages ago. You know, when the AIB was formed, Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, we talked about this as well. That was back in 2017, 16, I forget when was the AIB formed. You know, sometime back. But that is looking after our own interest. We should settle in our own currencies. Why go through the US dollar trade, right? So I'm not saying we should avoid dollar. I'm just saying we should look up our own interest. We are paying a huge transaction cost. Then who's making all the money? The bankers. Nothing wrong with that, but you don't need to make that. So if you notice now when you exchange money, my wife sends money to Japan for some things and all that. I can't believe the exchange rate the bank is giving. HSBC, Citibank, rates are getting are almost on the dollar from the website you see. Why? Is it because they're good-hearted and became benevolent? Why? Why do you think the banks are offering such good exchange rates now when you want to transfer money out? No, <laughs> no, no, no. Have you all heard of WISE? Is it called WISE? Oh, wow. WISE, right? And Huh? Instagram. I think Singapore is Instagram. Instagram, WISE. There's a whole bunch of alternative payment mechanisms for exchange transfer. They are providing implicit competition to the banks. So you've got to thank those guys for coming in and telling the banks, you can't make these kind of spreads. You know the spreads they used to make? Amex. You, you don't know if you use your Amex card and pay in US dollar, the exchange rate they used to use in the old days was horrible, the worst ever you can imagine. That's how they make their money. In addition to the commission they charge, 2% commission, they charge the uh, service provider. On top of that, they make money out of you from the exchange. Now you go look at your Amex card. I don't know, I've got a US Amex card. But if you, I don't know about Malaysian Amex card. 
But US Amex card, when I look at the exchange rate, it's so competitive, I, we don't even use other cards. We just use Amex. So competitive. They don't, they're not benevolent, not good-hearted. It's because of the competition. So the platform providers were actually quite um, crucial in bringing transaction costs down. Now I'm saying central banks should work more actively. Now, of course, America won't get upset. Uh, America will get upset. They want the dollar to be the dominant currency. So you don't go around bragging and saying, oh, we're doing this, we're doing that. Do it quietly, behind the scenes, you know? Yeah. Oh, dear professor, wow, so polite. Who is this, uh, William? Should Asia settle a new common Asian currency or ASEAN currency like Euro? No, no, no. I don't think we need to set up a new currency. We can just continue the currency because each economy is so different at different stages of growth. You cannot have this Euro problem. Germany was far ahead of Greece and the whole place went out of whack. Greece went bankrupt because of the difference in the growth rates and the wealth levels. You all remember the Euro crisis we had? We don't want that. We are too diverse in Asia and ASEAN. Let us all have our own currencies. If we want to be like Brunei and index with Singapore dollar, that's fine. Brunei does that. You, Singapore dollar and Brunei dollar is exchangeable, monetary union. They do it by choice and it works for them because it's a small country. You can do that, but don't force it upon us like the way uh, the Euro did, EU did. But what I'm saying is, despite all the differences in currencies and growth rates, we should work more closely together in our own self-interest, okay? Um, central banks should work, and, but don't brag about it. Just quietly do these things. You know what? Don't get a Russia, America, and all these people upset. Do it quietly because, you know, you don't want to humiliate anyone, but you're doing it in your own interest. Nobody is upset when you do something out of your own interest, you know? That means mutual interest, for that rather. Okay, so we've gone very uh, far. Um, Argentina is settling in Rumbi because they have to present the dwindling law, yeah, reserves. So basically, they are trying to avoid the cost because their reserves are going down a lot. So basically, they have to save costs. And one way to do it is to do direct exchanges. Sometimes even barter. You'll say, I'll give you cattle, beef, uh, Argentina, in exchange for rare earth or whatever it is. Huh? Okay. So what's the answer? What would you pick? This one, no mentee. What would you pick? You want, this is the problem, the functional approach, which product? That's what a true financial advisor does. Not start from the right-hand side and work backwards, which is what caused the global financial crisis. Anyone wants to raise your hand, whether online or in person? Which one would you pick? Based on these three things on the left-hand side was the investor's requirements to you as an advisor. Anyone? Very quiet at the back, anyone? Want to raise your hand and try? What would you pick, given these three needs? Which one? Target income, perfect, excellent. That's what I would pick as well. Target income or life annuity, like the CPF life. Unfortunately, EPF doesn't offer that, does it? Does it have a life annuity product? Not yet, but they will probably um, offer you some kind, hopefully, they've been talking about it, some kind of life energy product, okay? America has it, Singapore has it. It's like a pension, but it's provided by the government. CPF is Singapore government. In America, it's not a government, but it's a 401k, okay? Working with, because they're very big, they're billions of dollars, so they can work with providers, insurance providers to give you a life energy, okay? In Malaysia, it would be the EPF because they are the government authority, mandatory social security savings system. Next question. Goal is to provide for four years of tuition fees and lodging at a university beginning when your child is 18 years old. Let's say your child is six months old now, 18 years from now. That's a long runway, correct? So you want to give four years of tuition fees and lodging in America. Uh, America. You know, it's very expensive in America, right? To go to, say, Yale or MIT or Stanford, very expensive. So put yourself in that client's mind. He or she is not thinking of, you know, a small community college or polytech. He's thinking or she's thinking of Stanford, MIT, Princeton. What would you advise? 
Invest in growth equities when your child is young, then moving your investment slowly into bonds as they approach 18, as your child approaches 18, or buy a laddered inflation index bond portfolio maturing at age when your child is 18, 19, 20, 21. What would you advise? Second one. Now, some will advise the first one. Okay, they could. But the question is, what if at the age of 18, the market has a pandemic crash? It has happened. Some of my friends in America who are professors, when I was a professor, 1998, the market crashed. LTCM crisis. The market crashed. They were going to retire. They had this huge pot of money in mutual funds in their 403B. For professors, it's called 403B. Huge pot of money. And they put it in mutual funds, high fees. When the market crashed by 25, 30%, their mutual fund crashed by 40, 50% because of the fees and because of bad performance, even more. So now you have 1 million US dollars for retirement, suddenly you're down to $400,000. What do you do? Don't retire, la. Keep working, that's what they did, keep working. No, no, that's a good answer, keep working. No, the problem is you should not have done that. You should not have done that. No, what you have to do is, as you're approaching the age, let's say you want to take risk for retirement. You, as you get older, you should be moving to safer securities. Not at age 68, say, okay, now I'll buy bonds and all that to pay income. It's too late because the market crashed and now you find out you're out of pocket or buy for 600,000. That's dangerous, right? So the answer would be, I say safe way is that. That's exactly what CPF is doing. You invest in your CPF. What they're doing is giving you at age 65 a set of payments. They are buying the bonds for you. And they are called Singapore Security, uh, Singapore Special Government Securities, SSGS. You can't buy them in the market. Why? Because the interest rate they pay is higher than what they pay in the market. It's a special subsidized bond. And that's what Singapore government is doing for you. So that's what we should be doing as well if you want to do it correctly, okay? You want to think about diversification, hedging insurance, and the associate costs when planning your lifetime wealth and financial management strategy, you go and start a fintech company. Nothing wrong with that. I told you fintech companies and platforms have brought benefits. So I had a group of students at NUS. We have what's called NUS Enterprise. They are, it supports startups and all that. World class. It's second to Stanford's enterprise thing. Very well known. So a group of students got funded by the NUS enterprise. They came to me and said, Prof, we want to talk to you. We want you to be our advisor. I said, what are you doing? We're starting a financial ro uh, robo, robo advisor. Young kids, you know, for, uh, juniors in college and all that. The same type of people who start Carousel, who did well, yeah? Carousel, same. They were all NUS students. They came and told me. I said, what, what do you think you know more? Computer science, they're not, in, they're not even MBAs. They're from computer science undergrads. I said, what would you like to do? He said, we're going to make Piyush Gupta eat his lunch. Do you know who's Piyush Gupta? Don't know? Nobody knows Piyush Gupta? CEO of DBS. You know who's DBS? Uh, the biggest bank in Southeast Asia, DBS. We're going to make Piyush Gupta eat his lunch. When I heard that, I said, okay, sorry, thank you very much. I'm too busy, you know. You can't walk in here and say, I'm going to make the bank eat its lunch. Because what was Piyush Gupta doing? He's a very smart guy. He's brought DBS through huge profitability and so on. Biggest bank now in Southeast Asia, trying to acquire things in China, Hong Kong, and so on. He went and bought out startups. He went and did organic startups. Now they've got one of the best robo systems. If you go look up DBS, they've got robo advisor. Whether they built it internally or externally, how are you going to compete? And he offers even lower fees than you. So the question is, you have to see how can I work with the system? If there is a true solution I have that can disrupt the market, yeah. But don't start by saying, I'm going to disrupt Piyush Gupta's lunch. That's really a false premises. I'm sure the company doesn't exist anymore. But my point is, be careful what you wish for, right? When someone comes to you this, first see what are the alternatives out there? Are there solutions out there? 
In fact, there are two very good out, um, um, robots stash away. I think they have an office here in two, Malaysia. Stash away. Um, I may not agree with everything they do, um, but the thing is um, they are bringing costs down. Second is Endowers. They don't have an office here. They're in Singapore and Hong Kong. Endowers is a Singapore robo. They, what they've done is they brought costs down so much that it's become such a wonderful risk-adjusted product to invest in for your retirement. So much so the CPF was the first uh, the first ever robo allowed on CPF was Endowers. I'm not trying to put any company, but I'm just saying there are companies that were adding value and they still survive. Okay. And Endowers was run not by computer science juniors or nothing wrong with that. It's run by two principals who came. One was a Morgan Stanley CIO of Morgan Stanley Investment Management. He's Korean and the other is Singaporean um, who was at Goldman Sachs Asset Management. So these were people who were knowledgeable about the space, who partnered with some very smart computer scientists and technologists and worked together and built a product. I'm sure Stashaway is the same story. I don't know much about Stashaway, but it's a similar story. That means they are knowledgeable about the system. Huh? They're, they're knowledgeable about what they're getting into. Okay, so, so these are some of the shenanigans. How much time do I have? 10 more minutes? Okay, we're wrapping up already. So let me talk about the shenanigans. Okay, one is this um, late trading scandal. The late trading scandal is this. Like in Malaysia, in America, at 4 p.m., all the orders for mutual funds or unit trust must be in. 4 p.m., you must put it in. After all the orders are in, they will clear the market, determine the price, what's called the NAV of the mutual fund. Once a day at 4 p.m., 4.15 or 4.30, they'll get the NAV. Then you buy and sell at that NAV. Okay? There was a huge mutual fund crisis where what happened was, I'm an asset manager. Or it means I'm calculating all my NAV, right? Because I know all my securities. I'm the asset manager. I'm managing your retirement assets. At the end of the day, I want to give out the price, working with my custodian and trustee. What's the price? By 4 p.m., all the orders are in. But I'm an asset manager working in a universal bank. A universal bank means it's got a securities division. It's got a brokerage division. Huh? Like a UBS or a uh, Bank of America or a Citigroup, universal bank. They got asset manager and the uh, security side. Unfortunately, no Chinese wall. So the securities can see the buy side, you know, the asset manager's securities. So they know the price and all that, all that stuff. And they're also clearing the trades for them because they also are a seller of the mutual fund or buyer of the mutual fund for their clients, huh? private bank, whatever. So what do you think happens? Because they have internal system, they know the prices. They know the securities you hold. You're not supposed to know, but they know because shared IT platform. And then, not only that, 4 o'clock, all orders should be in. They will say, don't worry, we have access to the system. You can put the order in 4.15. Because after the market closes, there might be some market movements okay, that changes the price. So they will put the order in after 4.15. So what Spitzer... Elliot Spitzer, this is totally wrong. Huh? This is completely illegal because you have to give the orders at 4 p.m. No, after the market close, you can give the orders in. This is against the Fiduciary Act of the SEC. It happened in 2003. The Attorney General said, it's like betting on a horse after the horses have crossed the line. You know, you know already who won, then you put in the order. Fair or not? Not fair. Good, I'm glad you agree. That's what they were doing. It's not in a horse race, which is very obvious. This is the financial markets. These are fiduciaries doing this, cheating on the IT system. You say, who was running this shop doing this thing? It was a systematic problem. Everyone's doing it. You know why? Herding. When one person does it, tells the other, all the banks started doing it. So that was the reason. And so basically, it costs the industry, that means clients, $5 billion per annum was estimated by a Stanford academic. Five billion US dollars in costs to you because of this scandal. Anyway, people were caught. No one went to jail. People were caught. And uh, this happened to the global financial crisis of 2008, right? This happened in 2003. 
five years later, we have this people selling toxic assets as AAA products. Toxic assets as AAA. They wrap it into something, the like still toxic, subprime mortgages. But they wrap it up and make it look pretty and say this is an investment grade product. Then when the mortgage market blew up, guess what? No AAA. It was junk. You lost a lot of money. Hong Kong. Remember the Lehman Mini bonds problem? Singapore. I don't know if Malaysia anyone's affected. Hong Kong, Singapore. People are buying these Lehman Mini bonds thinking it's a AAA product when it was not. Okay? So this is what it's a greed is good. Don't ever watch this movie, Wall Street. I don't know if you have watched this movie. Handsome guy. I uh, forget his name. What's his name? Kirk Douglas. Uh. No, Michael Douglas. Married to Catherine Zeta Jones. Yeah, you know him? Uh, no. Oh. My, my question is how can it get to become a triple A product, right? Is it the, the ratings company is not doing their. Of course, job? that's part of that too, because they are being paid by the banks and so on. So they say, oh, this is good. We've wrapped it up. We've given a credit enhancement. It's all not true. You know, underlying is still toxic. What is toxic remains toxic. Unless you tell me Tomasek or K uh, Kazana or Bank Nagara said, we're going to guarantee. That is different. They provide the credit enhancement. That's different. Credible entity giving the credit enhancement. But when banks tell you they're giving a credit enhancement, don't believe it. Because it, when the crap hits the fan, again, I'd be careful how I use words. Huh? Crap hits the fan, it will blow up in your face. Clients get affected. Okay. I want to talk a bit about behavioral finance, but we may not have time because we want to wrap up in about five more minutes. Uh, but I would like them to, maybe they can give them the slides, whoever needs it. If you request it, Hamid, um, you know, under certain circumstances, uh, will release it. Be nice. Yeah. Uh, there's a behavioral set of slides. It's very easy. Just read up about the different types of behavioral biases that drives financial markets and causes prices to go out of whack, including bubbles. Herding is the most common. Framing, how you frame the problem. When you talk to a client, you give a positive frame, they think, oh, this is a good asset. Toxic asset becomes good. You give a negative frame, they'll think it's a bad asset. Don't buy this, sell it, sell it. Because you want to. You are a short seller. You are cast and block. Muddy waters. Have you heard of muddy waters? What do you do? You're always shorting the market. So when you talk to you, negative story, negative story. You hear negative story, you say sell. And then he makes money because he's short sold. When the price goes down, he makes money. Not because he cares about you. It's because he's talking up his book. Not to say he doesn't do good. He's done a lot of good. But he's also created false accusations against good companies. Okay, which price went down, he made money, then he walked away. He does a good function. I'm not saying he's a bad guy. It's just that when you're driven by greed, you tend to lose sense of what's right and wrong. I'm, I can't explain this. This is what I observe. They don't know that this is wrong. You have to tell them, no, no, no. Taking a $1,000 wine at a, from a broker when you are managing pension assets and having a fancy meal in a Michelin star restaurant is wrong. Just tell them to bring bagels. That's what I did. I'm not kidding. Where my staff around the world, I had staff in Zurich, London, New York running. Malaysia Bully. I was running this, all these guys. Okay. They would complain. Goldman, Barclays, they all can go out and eat at the Michelin star restaurants. You read about them. Flaming Ferraris, you know, the Flaming Ferrari boys in London, they were getting fed like fancy wines. I said, no way, because how can your judgment be not clouded if the broker is buying you such a nice meal? You give him the contract. You're running billions, $67 billion managed US in my team. I won't allow it. I said, you come with bagel and cream cheese. Uh, in New York, we eat bagels and cream cheese. Come to the office, eat there. You can buy the bagels and cream cheese, $1, 150 but no fancy food and wine and all this stuff. And sure enough, these fellows all got caught later. You know, same with mutual funds, the late trading market timing. You know it's wrong. Don't, don't do it. That's all I can say. Okay. So, and what are the behavioral biases? Let me go very quickly. I've already talked about uh, retirement, so I won't go over that. Oh, there's one thing I want to tell you about. There's now a reverse mortgage scheme. In Singapore, we have what's called the uh, lease buyback, which is like a reverse mortgage scheme. You can monetize your home. That means you can actually get income for retirement. So Chagamas is a Malaysian national mortgage corporation. They've started this reverse mortgage scheme 
which is low cost, which tries to help the people. So if you own a house, your grandparents, uncle, aunt who are retiring, find they don't have enough in the EPF, this is one way to monetize. Now, of course, when you do that, the house cannot be handed over to the next party because what happens at the end of the reverse mortgage period, you collect the income, okay? And at the end of that mortgage period, the house has to be sold. You only get the income from the remaining equity. So usually it's for retirement. So let's say you live for 30 years, the mortgage is 30 years long. At the end of 30 years, what happens is, oh, oh, you're promoting my book. Huh? Oh, thank you. <laughs> this one, my book. <laughs> That's a book. Uh, it's all in there too. It's all in there. Um, what happens is you basically uh, giving up the house to get income from it. That's called monetization programs. It's very popular in Western countries, not so popular in Asia, but it's getting popular because people find out they have not enough. They're asset rich, but cash poor. 80% of Singaporeans own homes. Malaysia, I think, is also a very high number. I think it's like 60%. So one thing you could do is monetize your assets so you don't go hungry. That's what my point is. Because many people's incomes, I mean, uh, uh, EPF assets are very low. One way to do it, if you own the home, you have to monetize it, you know? And that's one way Chagamas now offers it. I like Chagamas doing it because it's a government linked. I think it's Bank Negara linked probably. Is it Chagamas? Some kind of, or some kind of government entity. At least you can pseudo trust them as opposed to a straight private institution offering it. Uh, because 30 year mortgage is a long time, reverse mortgage, getting an income from it, from the bank, the bank will give you the income. It's a reverse. And then you hand the house over at the end of the mortgage. They sell it. If you still have equity in the house, your beneficiary gets the balance. The bank takes the, the remainder, uh, the main part for, to pay off the loan. It's like a loan, what we call a home equity loan. Okay, so I just want to talk about the Chagamas. Read up about it. It's all over the press and so on. I read about it. I got very excited and uh, even invited the Chagama CEO to give a talk here to our MBAs because I thought this was a very good innovation for Malaysia, especially as we find out people have too little to live on, okay, for retirement. Uh, don't worry about all this. This is just the same thing, have a protection and then upside participation. And so these are the Kindleberger six steps. You know, you have this period of what I call the peso premium. No news is good news, okay? You get some good investment, whether it's a regulatory change, whether it's a tax um, a benefit, or whether it's disruption in the marketplace, something that drives prices up. Good news or no news. Good news, right? And then suddenly, there's a frenzy. Everyone goes in and pumps up the price because they all say, go buy this, go buy. Never listen to rumors. In fact, try to be a contrarian. When someone says, go here, you sell it. You know? I mean, I'm not saying you should do it because of, I told you lah. I'm just saying that you should. Don't follow the crowd. Don't, don't just always follow the crowd, okay? Because the day of reckoning will come and then there'll be a huge uh, panic, prices crash. We see more crashes than prices running up suddenly. Crash means boom, sudden drop, a drawdown, as opposed to a sudden uplift. So be wary about drawdowns. It's all about risk and return. So these are all the crises. I talked about LTCM crisis, the Asian crisis of 98, the dot-com, I've talked about this, global financial crisis of 08, toxic assets became um, um, uh, good assets. Europe is still struggling. And um, so let me go through, I don't want to do this. I just want to give you the different types of, um, I just want to do the behavioral part. Okay, so here are they. This is on page 22 uh, on the slides. We have anchoring, decision made on the most available information, framing, which is a negative positive frame, prospect theory, I care more about losses than gains. I, I'm afraid of losses. It's called loss aversion. You give a lottery to the person, if the aversion, the probability of a big loss happening is so small, but the probability of making a lot of money is very high, they still don't want to see the big loss. Okay, so that's called prospect theory. Mental accounting, which is based on subjective criteria. Overconfidence, when you go see a lawyer and say, hey, what are markets doing? You say, oh, buy, 
these companies, these counters. They're so busy with legal work, how could they know about counters? You have financial market experts who can't predict which stock is going to go up in price. How can a lawyer or dentist or doctor, or, you know? So be careful. Overconfidence is when you think you know more than the market, when actually you're just reading everything in the papers that everyone else is reading. You've not done any financial analysis. This is the worst, herding, which leads to momentum or positive feedback trading. So as you herd, you follow the crowd, you pump up the price, and then boom, it crashes when the reality of the true valuation sticks in. Okay, so these are the basic behavioral biases. And I think that pretty much sums up what I'm going to, do, uh, going to say today, since we've run out of time. Um, uh, maybe we can do this question. How old do you think this man is? This is a her anchory. That's me, by the way. Yeah? Uh, he's between 52 and 62. Let's control group one. Separate out the groups. Control group two is between 62 and 72. Both spread of 10 years. The ones, the control group one will guess a lower age. Control group two, it will guess a higher age. You follow? Because of the, the way in which you phrase the question. That's called framing. Okay? So anyway, or anchoring. Sorry, that's anchoring. Uh, another example would be framing. FD has determined that approximately 90% of non-terminally ill patients taking this medicine will recover and lead a normal life. The FDA has determined that approximately 10% of non-terminally ill patients will expire, will die. Same information. But how you present it, this is framing. How you present it will cause you to whether take medicine or not take the medicine. Anyway, so what I want to say is I think we're reaching the end of this. Uh, I just want to say that uh, I really enjoyed talking to you all. I hope you enjoyed the session as well. Um, and it's all about being well-trained and being well-intentioned. Summary of today's talk. There's no difference whether you're in financial industry, regulator, you're a policymaker, in anything that you do, you've got to be both well-intentioned and well-trained. Now, if you really like what I talked about, I don't mean to push it, but somebody here reminded me I have a book. I forgot. Who is it? I think Hamid or Jikola. So, hey, how about your book? I said, oh, yeah, it's upstairs. So I just wrote about all this. These are all the things I've done for governments and policymakers and when I was a fund manager. So it's written into a layman's form. If you're interested, I told uh, you can submit it. You don't get this as part of your tuition, huh? just to let you know. Uh, that's not so lucky, but you can actually, is that, how are you going to do it? Oh, okay. What do you mean, let you know? You're going to pay for it? <laughs> Oh, okay, you talk to Hamid. Okay, okay. So anyway, uh, what I would say was, uh, um, it's written in layman's form, so that all the things I told you here, it's all covered here. But these are things that I advise governments, and when I ran my own money, so you can see there's a consistency in the way, you must have consistency. You cannot become born, uh, you know, you cannot be a, a revival late in stage. You've got to start early. So now is the right time to start thinking afresh. How can you be different? And believe me, you'll be rewarded. Long run, you'll be rewarded. Do the right thing for your clients, for your uh, customers, for your institutions, and I think it'll all work out. Okay? Uh, on that happy note, I'll pass it over back to Stephanie oh, or to Hamid. Yeah. Thank you all very much. <laughs>